They know that good times are twice the fun in pictures. And now, here's Harriet. You know, all of us have different tastes. We all like different things. And yet, when you make up your Christmas list, I think you'll find, as I have, that there's one thing everybody likes. Children, older folks, everybody enjoys taking and having pictures. They're ideal gifts for everybody. For instance, I'll bet you know some boy or girl who'd love this brownie star flash outfit. See, it has everything he needs for pictures, indoors or out. And there are other brownie outfits for everyone on the list. Complete camera outfits start at 1035. See them this week at stores that display this sign. The only evidence of our parents as human beings was on film. Our idea of what the past worth saving looks like is film. People would tell me, like, but why do you want to learn this? It's in like five years from now, no one's going to be shooting this. Like, it's useless. This is outdated. A lot of people who don't see photography as really a pursuit or a, an art, I don't think they really totally understand why someone would choose to spend the money, to take the time, make the effort to shoot film when digital is, makes it so much easier. There has been this new wave of analog, for sure, there's no doubt about it. There was a part of me that wanted to be a little skeptical of it, to think, oh, this is a trend. But I, I think there's something else at play. As millennials, we have this crisis. Our generation is at the constant crisis of trying to find the authenticity. There is a growing interest in analog photography. Ten years ago, who would have thought that we'd be sitting here talking about film? There's been this evolution in the way the world out there deals with images <laughs> and the commercial world deals with images. Early on, the magazine work was very low pay, but they would pay these expenses and they would pay for my film and it was amazing. And I got to like practice essentially. I got, you know, this to shoot tons and tons of film on someone else's dime, which made me better and faster at it. And then, you know, the world changed. And art directors and magazine editors, they wanted things today, like they wanted it submitted now. In 2007, I worked at OK Magazine. <laughs> and back then, OK Magazine was shooting all their editorials on medium format film. Between 2010-ish, 2009, and basically the crash, there was a dip, and all those people were like, how can we cut costs and stay in print? Um, and so they went digital. Right up until I think about 2012 is when really film probably bottomed out for the most part. Between 2012 and 2014, you just saw some flat sales, but they were nowhere near um, like the, even five years before. And then since then, it's been on a double digit growth since about 2015, right up into the present day. And I don't mean like double digit growth where it's just one or two percent more than the year before. It's been significant. We have trouble even keeping film in stock. 
I start seeing like a major, major increase on, on you know, film shooters and you know, street photographers that went back to film. And uh, magazines started to give budget on, you know, like commercial jobs on film and stuff like that. We average on a daily basis about 700 rolls a day. When we open seven days and we can't even keep up with production sometimes, you know. I'm sure there's other labs there that are also noticing the same thing. My name is Lucia Rallo, and I'm the founder of the Bushwick Community Darkroom, which is where we are. We're open to everybody. Seven days a week, people can rent this space, or they can drop off film and have us develop for them. They can also get a membership. The memberships get 24-7 access um, to everything. And they can also volunteer. Um, and the volunteers get one hour of darkroom time in exchange for every hour that they work. It was 2011 that I started it in my basement and I'm pretty sure it was 2012 that Kodak most recently declared bankruptcy. And so that was an interesting point in time because they were, you know, slowing down developments of film and all that stuff. Saying you're gonna go out and start a black and white darkroom <laughs> It's not necessarily like the most logical thing in the world. So yeah, people definitely like gave me some looks and did not offer the most support. And then it turned out that film wasn't dying. So here we are. <laughs> there are tons of other places like this. There's one in Knoxville. There's one in Nashville. I think there's one in Cleveland, and there's one in Detroit that just opened recently, and it seems like, I would say, within the last, like, six months to a year, like, more and more of them have started popping up. They're kind of just popping up everywhere. It's great. The more I thought about it and talked about it, the more it just seemed like a good idea, honestly. You know, the business model, it's kind of self-sustaining in a way. Members run it, um, volunteers run it. You know, people who are here are passionate, so we take care of the space. The old school photographers I was talking to, they definitely thought I was nuts, for sure. Because for them, you know, film died in the 90s. Looking at me, this young person, like, why do you want to do that? You know, everyone shoots digital now. And then I'm getting in touch with all these old New York photographers who have just storage stockpiles of equipment. I'm going to see these places out in Queens, on the Bronx, and they have amazing equipment, the best equipment. I got it all for free. When digital came around in the late 1990s, early 2000s, people were ringing the death knell of film and analog photography. They were literally throwing away cameras. The input we were getting from older photographers were like, no, I'm not going back to film again. Like, I've, I'm done with it. I've beat so much, and I hated it when I had no other option, that I'm not going back to that. But there is a new generation that is okay. This is an option now. People who came to photography when digital was the norm, they learned photography through digital processes. They're interested, obviously, in the analog processes because one thing, they're physical. 
they're directly connected to physics. You, you really see how light works and you, it's really tactile. But also just standing up, walking around, <laughs> using your hands and problem solving. Like, okay, how, is, how do I fix this easel? Oh, I use a piece of tape here or I do this or, you know, how do I make this print look good? Oh, I use a piece of cardboard and burn this. Like this is one of the tools. This is, this is like an important tool in analog photography and it's not something you have to have a subscription every month to to keep. You just, it's cardboard. <laughs>darkroom, there is a, a respect for materials. There is a, a connection between uh, the photographer and the paper. There are so many human factors that work together to make the final piece, the final photograph. living in the analog space. It's not just about uh, the final result. It's about the whole process.
when I go out there, I don't have any expectations. You know, I'm not like, oh, I need to get the, I need to see, I need to get the, because I know it's going to take a while to get to it anyway, you know? And so when I go out there, it's just like, I'm out here and this is what I'm doing. I'm not worried about what the image is going to look like. All of that thinking, all of that thinking about, you know, composition, what are you trying to say in your images? Where do you want to go? All that stuff is super important, but I don't really do that in the field. I do that when I'm in here. I do that when I'm in my dark room, when I'm looking through negatives and contact sheets or if I'm talking to friends. When you use a digital camera, you live in the screen. You like take your shot, you look, like, oh, this could be a little bit better if I, if I lined it up right. Uh, you know, you're constantly editing yourself. You're thinking about, you're thinking about photos. You're thinking about photography. With the film camera, you are, you think about what's in front of you. The way I shoot uh, can only be like that because uh, I don't see what I'm actually shooting on the back of the camera. If I saw something on the back of the screen, uh, either I would say, oh yes, I've got it, uh, or I would say, I'll continue, but the next photograph will be affected by the previous one. I learned to not know so much. It's better, even when I photograph, to put myself in a situation and see what happens. I don't want to know the outcome. This tool like just kind of like allows me to do that without all that extra stress of buttons and screens and trying to review, make sure I got a banger. Like I get free of all that. I just go out, throw some film in my pockets, and, and that's it. Going to the lab, still I was excited. I've been doing that for almost 15, 20 years. You can ask her, like a little kid. Do you have the photo? Do you have the photo? You don't have that in digital. You don't have that in digital. In digital, you've got a digital operator with a big screen, and you're looking at the photo like that. And you see them, oh, no, no, yeah, OK. There is this like psychological trick where it it really like forced the divide between my Jekyll and Hyde brain. So there's one guy who goes out and does the work, who like walks all day, exhausts himself, kind of embarrasses himself. And there's the other guy who receives that guy's work and looks through it, almost as if it's like the discovery, you know, discovered work of a stranger. It's one in the morning. I get a, you know a, f a, f a file of scans, of like 150 new photos. I'm like, okay, what'd this guy do this time? What's worthwhile in this work? What connects to the full body of work? And I, you know, that just that never happens for me with digital. Daniel Arnold, and I am uh, a photographer. That means lately that when I'm not on assignment, I am usually just kind of scouring the streets for miracles, uh, for chance alignments of of greatness for, you know, things that, that make looking worthwhile. And when I am on assignment, because I'm the luckiest guy alive, my job almost always is to, like, do what you're doing, but do it in this room that you couldn't get into on your own. I mean, I always had 
and appreciation for film. Like there was always something automatically better about film pictures. So I, you know, was sure to always have disposable cameras handy. There's a certain state of mind, I think, that comes with using a digital SLR. The emphasis is on precision and technique. For me, it always was more about the camera than it was about the world. And with a disposable camera, although you, know, you obviously sacrifice some quality and some reliability, it was just like, it's just the kind of thing that you, you, know, you just pick up and point in the direction and hit the button and hope for the best because no matter what you do, it's gonna look a certain way and maybe if you're lucky, it'll be in focus. Usually not. The camera was there for those split seconds where I had that like flash of light. It was like, oh, there's a picture. Or like, you know, this is a thing worth remembering. Or that makes me feel really weird. Or, this is hilarious. Uh, it was just like this, this sort of almost an afterthought thing where I just had to have it in case. Instead of I have to have this complicated machine that can make a thousand documents of everything I look at. Think about it. What is the plan when someone shoots digital? What is the concept of it? To shoot a thousand of pictures to get probably too good that you're gonna edit making look like film. Isn't there something wrong in here? You know what I'm saying? The possibilities needed to be narrowed down. Because coming home with a thousand digital pictures that you shot in a day, it's just, I don't know. That's, to me, that's a waste of my time. Film, of course, is an enormous limitation. Um, it means you have one film speed. <laughs> and it, it means you can't, oh, I can't, work, I can't photograph things that are moving this fast or in this light. And that can be frustrating, but those frustrations force you to do other things. When I'm holding up a film camera, I know that that frame of film that's ready to be shot is going to cost me a certain amount of money and time to bring into the world. And for some people, not everyone, for some people, those are very, very good reasons to think more about what you're shooting, to frame it better, to try to get it all in the one shot. I do think film definitely influences my work. There's a different type of connection you have with your subject. They know it's just something between you and the camera and the rule of film. They know like, oh, you got 36 shots and do the best you can with these 36 moments. analog process, um, it just slows me down. When I make my own work, I just put myself into it. I really have to see what I photograph. That makes me think about what I was looking at, what I want to, to photograph. That slowness affords me time to spend with my subjects, time to do other things, and it's brought my whole expectation level way down. If you're shooting digital, you know, maybe you expect 100 pictures. If I'm shooting wet plate, maybe I expect one picture. That's a good day.
My name is Yoji Imasaka and I am a large format photographer. I'm really influenced by Shinto idea. Admiring the nature and then f having a, a ow feeling, kind of afraid of the nature. What I've been trying to do is re-visualize the feeling into the photography. I have to sometimes wait a couple hours or I have to come back next day to just get the perfect, perfect lighting. Every single time I, uh, I travel for my shooting, I think like without this big camera and then all those gears such as heavy tripod, film holder and so on, you know, if it was only digital one camera, that would be so much easier and so convenient for me. But then I think myself, with digital, could I make an image that I really want? There's no choice, I have to take these guys even though it's pain. I think the reason that people started doing more analog is because everyone was just sick of looking at all the same digital looking photographs. Like there's a lot of diversity that you can do with different lenses and different cameras and different formats and different films, different processing um, with the analog process where the digital, it's very straightforward look. There's really only so much you can do. I was very always attracted to, to film and people would tell me like, but why do you want to learn this? It's in like five years from now, no one's going to be shooting this. Like it's useless. This is outdated. If you come to my fridge, you see that I actually have more film that I have food and that's always the case in my house. I wouldn't say I overshoot but I do tend to I get excited and I just want to get as much as I can. Every camera has a different peculiar characteristic that makes me want to use it. You know I jump between cameras and cameras and I do have a tendency of shooting with several cameras on the same shoot. It really depends of what I'm trying to also accomplish in terms of the look of the photo. The reason why film photography appeals to so many people now is the lack of perfection. It's funny that the, the, the films that we sell more now and that we scan more are those mainly in black and white, who don't have like completely silver, silk look. Back in the day, one of the challenges of uh, the producers was to make film with that it was not full of grain, that you can see all the details and sharpness and so on. But now we have that already with digital cameras. So people who goes back to film, they look for this grain. It's buttery, is always the way I talk about film. 
uh, it, it's like a cream in the soup and it like does this buttery thing. You know, if you're making like techno music or like really precise commercial looking pictures, it's probably not right to have all that butter mixed in. <laughs> Um, but for certain kinds of work, that kind of warmth is something I like. People are running around with digital cameras that focus, that expose. You go to these exhibitions and everything looks the same. It's not just the same. It looks great. Flawless. If that's what you think is great. sharpness and detail and all that aren't everything. And, you know, when you look at, like, the, the quote, best digital capture capabilities now, a lot of times they are sharper than even an 8x10 image. But I don't know if we connect to that so much. Everything is uh, clean and sharp, uh, but that Clarity maybe is not what a human being is made for. We go into higher and higher and higher definition. Well, I love the grain. The grain is there. It's part of uh, the nature of the film. It's the texture of it. It's uh, the history of it. It's part of where the subject will uh, uh, sit on top uh, when you print. Uh, The grain is not so much of a player in color films. It's more about color palettes. How you see something and you take a picture with film, and it's not exactly the color that you saw, but perhaps it's a bit more beautiful when it goes with the others. The colors that you can get from the analog process that are coming off of those papers and out of those processors are different than anything you can get. You can't, you can't replicate that in digital. So when you're making those prints and then you're scanning those prints, you're getting colors that you wouldn't be getting otherwise. There's this like very specific yellow that like you can only get in analog. And there's a certain red that these Kodak papers give that is just so exclusive. the softness of highlights, the beautiful contrast in what seems like a very low contrast image. A sense of this 3D depth to it, while at the same time being like not over sharp, very soft, very like hazy sometimes. This is what I love. This is what you cannot even get with like a negative scan. This is purely created by optical printing in the darkroom. It gives me a proper purpose to create my art. It almost legitimizes my position as a photographer. There's a different type of ownership of your image when you can own your process from very beginning to end not just from conceptualizing an idea, but from actually as well going into the dark room and then printing yourself and developing your own stuff. It, it makes it almost like it's a little more yours. It, it transforms the level of ownership you have of that image, like it's fully yours now. I love when I get dust on my stuff. Like I never want my photos to be too perfect. My shit's never clean. It's never really like precise in that sense. Perfection is fucking boring and it's like an illusion. There's nothing really, life's not perfect. Why should art be perfect? As humans, I feel we like distortion. In music, we like a little bit of uh, static. 
I think it's interesting to our ears and our minds. It's, it's something that's, it activates us and it's, it's very curious. And I think visually too, we liked to not have it all revealed maybe, or there's a little a bit of something. Because we know that a photograph is not reality, it's a photograph. I love fucking with my film to see what other results I can get. I started really experimenting with film soaks and using the elements of the places I'm shooting within the film. Um, you can put water from the rivers where you shot near, or like sometimes I'll collect. I just went to Marfa and I literally made a jar and I collected and I put all things that I found there. And I'm going to mix it with all my film now and I'm going to use that to affect the emotion and see how the elements of the environment can actually affect the image making. Oh, I'm so stoked. It's gonna be beautiful. <laughs> so excited. I can't wait to develop already. Did I fuck this up? Did I fuck it up to the point where it's no good? Or is it fucked up just enough where it made it good? Twenty-five years ago, when we started lomography, on every lab machine there was someone sitting and crossing out pictures which were out of focus or had light leaks. We needed to communicate as something very special and it was an educational process in both ways towards the lomographers plus towards the labs to convince them that this is very valuable. That was the time where we still smuggled cameras from Russia to Vienna. And then we visited a fair in London, I think, and then we found the action sampler. And we thought that's really great because it's a mixture between film and photo. We repacked it and we went to China and it was our first production process we, we had to learn. Many of these cameras did not work at all, actually. And then we wrote a little booklet coming with the camera, and the first sentence was, in your hand you have the most fucked up camera with the most fucked up lenses ever, uh, <laughs> so you will have a hard time to shoot a nice picture. If you shoot one, you're gonna get an art piece. You try hard, you fight hard, and then you get a, most likely one of your pictures will be totally exciting and totally different, and this is the reason why you buy it. Experimental approach. Having the camera in the hand, you make mistakes. And to be honest, this is how I get to get my own style. And so I will provoke this mistake. I got to have this camera that was the Olympus Mewtwo. and got a little um, cutter, like a little knife. And I did chick, chick, two little slices of cutter on the right or left side, I can't remember of the camera. Just that, I did that, and that's it. I put the film in and I forgot about it. 
and then I keep going my photo. Wow. It was every single photo was a one of a kind. Because every time the light will go through this little cut I did in a different way. So let's say if it was very sunny, we go really strong and burn the whole side of it. You know, so the half of the photo will be burned. But when it was a little bit less light, it'll be a little burn. When it was gray weather, it'll be a little blue part. And then each of the photo will be different. One of a kind. You don't have that in digital. When Instagram started to be a big thing, and everybody put filters on their photos. I'm like, why are you so ashamed of your digital picture that you want to make it look like film in a weird way, in a way that doesn't really look like film, that film never really looked like? If you change a picture, then you always have a certain something in your mind, and then you, and then you design something with your intention. It's an intentional act, in opposite to Analog photography with, uh, with a random film and a random camera and a random lab is an experimental act. Like painting, when you either you want to be the most realistic or you take a color and, and, and throw it on the, on the, on the, on the canvas. That's a, that's a different approach and you don't know what's coming out, but you don't start to change, to make it better, to make it different. Instagram in a sense, creates uh, communities of people that can find each other that otherwise would not have found each other. Made it so you could be anywhere in a bubble fuck, anywhere in a world, and somebody could discover your work. I'm always, I'm always, always on Instagram. I may not post on Instagram as much as I'd like to, but I, I consume a lot of images, and so I very easily get caught up. I'm like so over-consumed with images that I, I can't really think. I become a little self-conscious about what I'm creating, maybe how I'm not producing as much. The speed of digestion, the way that people digest photography, the way that people understand photography has obviously uh, changed. I look at it as a tool, like it's a way to, to put my work out there, to you know share what I do. There's not an ending. It's not like go outside, I take pictures, and I put it on Instagram, and boom, it's done, it's over. Like, hell no. Like, that has nothing to do with it. My name is Andre Wagner. I'm a photographer based in Brooklyn, New York. I um, was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Moved to Brooklyn in 2011. You know, just roamed the streets taking pictures <laughs> all throughout New York, really. The street photographers are so independent, just in their own world, out taking pictures. It's, it can be really lonely, you know. You just work when you want to work. You just you just get to it. I'm constantly going back and forth on my lens, like F8, F11. If I'm crossing the street, if I'm going on the sunny side of the street, is it the shady side of the street? You know, you're, you you become programmed with like all of these like little settings and elements that you know have an impact on the outcome of how the images look. With film, it's, you know, every aspect was a variable that can be changed, you know, so it's like from depending, deciding on your film stock that you're going to shoot and how you're going to expose it to 
how it's going to be developed to how it's either going to be scanned and then printed. working with manual cameras, like all of these things have to happen by hand, so you're making decisions about every part of the process. A large part of even shooting this is the print, is the silver gelatin print, is the black and white silver gelatin print. Ownership over just the whole process, like, I don't know, that's really important to me. I don't necessarily always want to be in the dark room. Like being in that dark room has helped me technically be more sound. It's helped me arrive at like a place of like make like streamlining the where I can like print better because I can expose better. And also just like living with your work under the enlarger in chemicals, like constantly looking at your own images. Like it's an amazing way to edit. Bruce Gilden. Who has a show in, where is it? In Italy, right? Are you going to Italy? I'm not sure. No. Usually. Okay. That right there is a, a great testimony of analog photography. The fact that you can have a negative and yank it out of the the drawer after, I don't know, that's, that's got to be 40 years old, at least. And uh, all the information's there. You know, it's a little bit worn out, but it's all redeemable. I took maybe eight, ten pictures of that scene. They probably had a sense of humor. So, because they were laughing already, so I don't know whether they said, well, uh, what do you take us because we look alike or because we're heavy, because who the hell knows? And it was also taken probably on 42nd Street because you have the peep show in the back. And in those pictures from that time period, I enjoy looking at the backgrounds a lot. It is quite funny. It does make me smile every time I see it because they're just... They're like light, you know? When I say light, their mood is light, okay? So you have scratches in the negative here and all these little dust spots. But that, that's, a, that's a pretty good scratch in the negative. Because yeah, old negative. Yeah. But he, beautiful. But he likes like that toned down with all garbage is usually. He likes to what? Yeah, toned down that old garbage is. He doesn't like the garbage so much? No, because it, Ice it takes, yeah, it takes yeah, up. It oh my God. And he doesn't, he want me to like, uh, take care up. of the flare? Yeah. Jeez, that's a lot of work. Yeah. What always concerned me was the photograph. I don't give a shit about anything else. I care about the photograph. To me, it's about 
you took the image, the image is good, that's fine. If you want to take a piece of dirt out or there's a little scratch something, there's a time period in Coney Island. I would save up all these rolls. I would get like 300 rolls before I developed them. And then I saw my camera inside had a, a hair, and I had 100 rolls with a hair in it, you know, coming down like this deep into the negative. I'm, to I'm not talking about just a drop. So I had to have that etched out. What, am I going to have a large piece of dirt in there? We grew up in a time where TV and the movies were all on film and where, you know, the only evidence of our parents as human beings was on film or like wedding albums or, you know, whatever our idea of what the, the, the past worth saving looks like is film. We had quite a few floods in my house when we lost a lot of things. And the things that I recall my family crying the most for, like my mom, my grandma, was always photos, family photos. We don't, I don't have many family photos left. I don't have, you know, family albums and things like that. And to think that our generation probably won't even have that just because we don't print anything. Everything's on a cell phone. It's like, how, how often do you really look through your camera roll? Um, people shoot everything they see. People go to concerts. They want to get their 30-second Instagram. But how often do we really go back and we make a point to look at these things? We start to think, like, what are we going to leave our kids? I still am getting these beautiful silver gelatin prints from my grandparents and my parents. And if we don't take the time to either print out our photos or shoot on film, um, we're just left with a bunch of like hard drives. I found this box. I found this box of Nike and I'm like, oh my God, this is like, look, a really vintage Nike box. Open the box, no, no shoes inside, but those uh, photographs. When I saw this photo, I was like, wow, this is insane. They look very candid, very easy to take. And that was my dad photograph. And I realized that I copied everything about it. My photo of me or my brother or, or some of his friends, the way he took the photo, snap, that was like, wow. I want to do that now and make memories. My photo that you know, from Off-White, Carhartt, Nike, Converse, Bianca Chandon, any brand, you name it, everybody that I shot, there is no Photoshop on it. You have to know that. It's very important. No color correction, no contrast correction, no skinnier, liquify, blah, 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 you name it. None of it. Just straight out from the camera, put the logo, it was done. Oh my God, I still remember coming to a meeting and everybody was like, the, the second they heard that you should film, you are in a c category of film photographers. That means someday, maybe, for something that's insignificant. Within the last year, my work was probably 90% film and 10% digital. Drastically different from what it was like two years ago. There is this huge interest from the clients towards film. There are clients that book you for that specific look. Some clients just love what they're seeing and they're like, whatever you want to do, just give us that. I just shot on a film set for the first time as a stills photographer. In the movie, there's this kind of like iconic black and white image is, that's being made by one of the actors, one of the characters in the film. And so the director put me in to, to actually make that image. I got on set, I made the image, I flew back to New York the next day, <laughs> developed the film, scanned it, 
sent it over because like they needed that picture like two days later for another scene because they needed these printouts. This is a big production. They're shooting all of these cameras and then I come in with my little camera and I'm like... <laughs> I guess I fell in love with printing pretty much the first time I was in the darkroom. It was just like such a special secret place. It's like this little sanctuary. You don't know what you're gonna get until it comes out. Five minutes is a long time when you're waiting to see. Some of my clients who are younger, since they've grown up with the technology of digital and then are now being introduced to using the analog process, they are really quite savvy at how they're marrying the two together and they're using both mediums for what they're good at. In the case of when we, I was working with Stuart Weinkoff, we kind of explored both of those avenues. Are you gonna have this as like, part of the show? Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, one second for this, so it's like this was one second. Oh, actually, you know what? This was one second F. I should write, probably just write this down. Like, I just wonder, it's mm -hmm. like, to me, I feel like the, like these color tones, I could probably, like, it's it's the problem with this scan, right? Like, I could work on the scan so that I could like- It get can it get closer, closer for sure. It's more just like, what's the detail difference? Right. I mean, not that I necessarily, you know, it's like with flashing, I don't necessarily want to see grain. Uh, you know, it's like grain isn't necessarily an issue. Like, I like, I kind of like the creaminess, but, um, we can still make it soft. There's going to be more grain than this, yeah, but it, the sure. tones will still be nice and smooth. Right. Yeah. This is the scan of the actual C print that was made and then printed digitally. This is a scan of actual negative. This is all digital process. Yeah. And then this is half digital. And then we're going to do an all analog version. Yeah. We ended up going with the purely analog version and part of that decision was those really rich reds and yellows that you get from that process. We couldn't find a way to replicate that um, in, the other, in the other methods. The big thing I miss about working in the dark room, I don't necessarily miss so much rolling around on the floor, like making big prints and stuff and getting dirty and having, you know, working with a negative that had a scratch that I couldn't take out or, you know, I like a lot of those post-production things you can do in digital, but I miss the community. The community was everything and the people that I would meet, the work you would see other people making and you wouldn't even know who they are. You'd see somebody printing something, you're like, oh, I've seen that image. I saw that image in Aperture or Blindspot or some gallery. And then you'd meet that person and you'd have a, a dialogue with them and a conversation. I mean, that's the big thing I think that people miss and they really wanna, they wanna have. They wanna have community, they wanna have connection. We just all share this unique passion for something that we all wanna help. And there's enough of a technical like uh, element to it that people want to share knowledge. From uh, the beginning of August to the middle of November, we traveled the country stopping in 17 cities, 18 if you count New York, distributing film for free to local photographers 
asking them to shoot and return the film to us to be a part of a larger exhibition and, and book. Um, ended up reaching 1,300 photographers across the country. It was a pretty young demographic that participated. I would say the average age was probably somewhere between 25 and 30. People love dark rooms. And having this space was very important. When people came to see us, we could actually invite them into our space and have them cross from the public domain into something that we built and that we were traveling with so that they could then feel comfortable sharing their pictures and maybe a personal story. The idea of community in photography has always been something interweaved and though the internet allows for us to create communities across time and space in a way, I think people still need personal interaction and, and physical space and photography labs and classrooms are all about how to exist within the community. We look at other photographers work in a classroom setting. We work in the dark room together, uh, we process film together, and I think it's a big thing that attracts young people is a real community. I'm Delilah, I'm 14, and I shoot analog. I started shooting analog because it was a club in my school, and I thought it would just be fun to try photography, and then I got hooked. I have memories like from middle school that I would never have remembered if I hadn't snapped it. Developing film is frustrating and satisfying because if your film gets messed up or if there's a splotch or if your favorite picture is now messed up, you're frustrated because you really wanted to print that. But it's also satisfying to see the prints and see what you made and see what the outcome is because you never really know what could really happen. This one and these. And I call him Mr. Tree, so it's And perfect. this is beautiful too with the train passing. It's just fun to be in the dark room because I'm with all my friends and I'm having fun. <laughs> You're taking pictures and when you print them, you realize like, oh my God, that was actually a really good print and it's actually like so good and you didn't expect it to come out that good. Those are the youngest people we have coming into the International Center of Photography. I mean, they're like 14, 15, 16 years old. And they're doing mainly black and white. They're printing in the, the analog color darkroom. And they, I don't know, I sense that they love the process too. And those are all, anybody that age, they're all really just on their phones. And, and I think they're starting to say that they don't want to spend so much time on the screen. Should a person be proud to have made an analog picture? You know, it's, it's, it's reminiscent of like, even in pre-digital era, people doing tintypes are feeling extra proud because of the extra labor. 
like with any kind of craft or uh, maybe like, you know, you're a fisherman and you do fly fishing and it's, you know, there's more craftsmanship to it and there's a pride to it. But, um, but also like you catch the fish that you catch, <laughs> you know, in the end. It puts the person in a certain elite category, you know, uh, because, you know, film is special, but, you know, film is great, but it's what you do with the film. It's not what you use, it's how you use it. And I think that's the most important thing. Knowing that the image was shot on film isn't going to make me feel like it's more important or that it was harder or that there was makes me feel anything greater. None of that happens. Just because it was shot on film doesn't make it better. Like, it doesn't. <laughs> Digital photography is an incredibly democratizing uh, form uh, of photography, and it, it certainly has its place. But everybody has a particular sensibility. I think it would be unfortunate if somebody was only given an iPhone, who perhaps would be a great film photographer. They should be exposed to it to see if that's a good fit. You know, you have an orchestra, uh, and there are all these instruments. And if there was only one instrument Let's just say it was the timpani drum, and everybody in that orchestra could only play the timpani drum. Well, what would that music sound like? I care about how I present my work to the world, and uh, the most honest way for me is uh, to lock myself into the dark room and uh, kill myself on that sheet of paper that will have to turn into something. I don't think there is a shred of my, my film usage that is a rebellion. It's not out of like a, a desire to separate myself from digital photography. I don't have any bad feelings about other people's digital photography. It's just that it's a different thing. It's not better or worse. It's just that it's a completely different practice. I mean, they should almost give a digital camera a different name. As millennials, we have this crisis. Our generation is at the constant crisis of trying to find the authenticity. We're lacking authenticity. So for, for millennials, it's always like trying to find what's the real thing. Yeah, absolutely. I could add light leaks digitally. I could add the texture digitally. I could make those film colors digitally these days. There's visco, there are all of these things. I just, why would I if I could also do it on camera, the real way. I don't care the reason why I, I want to be so hardcore in that. I, I just know that that's the way I photograph. And if I want photography to be the most natural thing for me, I don't have to do anything that seems artificial. You know, there's, there's all these kind of intangible qualities that are not about, they're not about quantitative things like the number of megapixels and the number of, and the degree of sharpness and these things. It's, it's about the feel. An example is, if I send a postcard to my girlfriend and I do it on the computer or I do it by hand, you know, the message is going to be the same, the, the letters are going to be the same, she is going to understand it the same, but it's going to be completely different, you know. So sometimes we focus on this 
perfection or like this efficiency and we miss so many things on the way. We thought like everybody else, this was gonna be temporary. It was only gonna be a month at the most, two months, and we'd be back to normal. Um, here we are in August, and we are not back to normal. With the exception of film. Film seems to be um, pandemic resistant. It, it has bucked the odds and people are still buying film. The number of people that were dropping off film basically increased by a factor of five. And people just started mailing in film from all over the country. In like April and May, it was like basically photos of people either like in their houses, like by themselves, a lot of bedrooms, a lot of mirror selfies, you know, a certain amount of sex, um, one home birth, and then as soon as the protest started, it just flipped. Nothing is more archival than film, and that's history, and you want to document history in the most archival medium that you possibly can. like this opportunity to get these moments that like you know they're not gonna happen again. I've been doing photography for so long and like why would I quit now if I've been doing it for so long? Like if I was gonna quit I would have did it my first year and been done with it and stopped joining the club. <laughs>